Great, thank you, Pete. Um, hopefully you can all see my slides. Yeah. Uh, so as Pete said, we're holding this celebration event as we come to the end of our More Data for Nature project, where we've been working with local groups who have been undertaking ecological monitoring on their sites. And as well as the local groups, we want to say thank you to our Data for Nature volunteers who have been helping us to implement our ecological monitoring framework on our nature reserves. We, we want to highlight the achievements of these projects and also to update you with the developments we've made to our Nature Counts biological recording website over the past year. So I'm just going to start by telling you a little bit about the background to these projects. And it all kind of started with the Sheffield State of Nature report, which was launched in April 2018. And this addressed gaps in Sheffield's ecological data. And the key recommendation from this uh, was to work to improve the quality of the data available on Sheffield wildlife and habitats, both on our reserves and also throughout the Sheffield and Rodham area. So as a response to this, the Data for Nature project was developed and it was initially an 18 month project, um, but it's now fulfilled by a permanent role. And the initial aims of the project were to improve our ecological data capture and management through the creation of Nature Counts Biological Recording website and also to establish a robust monitoring framework on our nature reserves through the development of new monitoring protocols for key species and habitats across Sheffield and Rotherham, both of which we're continue to, continuing to roll out and improve. More data for nature is the second phase of the project. And through this project, we've been working with local groups to monitor sites beyond our nature reserves. And we've also made further developments to our Nature Counts database. So I'll just go through these in a little bit more detail. So the first 18 months of the Data for Nature project set up this approach to ecological monitoring and data capture man management. Survey protocols were written specifying which species and habitats to survey, when and how often and how these surveys should be performed. And we undertook surveys of key species and habitats across our reserves by a trained volunteer network. And data is captured in our data management system, which includes our nat Nature Counts biological recording website. We can then use this data to map and analyze the information and create, create reports and use these to inform management practices with the aim of achieving targeted and effective conservation. So this continues every year as part of our ecological monitoring framework on our nature reserves, and it's the approach we used to roll out monitoring to the local groups. Crucially, this monitoring approach is systematic and repeatable, and it's built around measurable attribute targets, which act as trigger points to precipitate remedial action if they're not met. So I'm just gonna demonstrate this with a few examples um, from last year, starting with our nature reserves. So one approach we use to monitoring is the spatial grid approach. So this uses grid squares overlaid over a nature reserve or part of it at an appropriate scale for monitoring. And our volunteers go out and measure attributes in each grid square and use a tick list of positive or negative species found in each survey grid, vegetation coverage, sward heights or other structural attributes and anything else of interest such as flower spikes of a particular species. And as monitoring is undertaken in each square, the results can be heat mapped to visualize results. So we can see where we're doing well and where we might need to make some improvements. So this example is of Greno Wood and we carried out a baseline woodland condition assessment, uh, both in the autumn looking at structural attributes and in spring looking at species cover. This was over a large scale with grids measuring 100 meters by 100 meters. So we've been able to provide the nature recovery manager with maps like this one, showing where, for example, uh, we have sort of native species richness, where it's highest and where it's lowest. And other things like where there are non-native species, um, what the species composition is, whether there are invasive non-native species, what the cover of holly is, whether there are temporary open spaces, what the condition of the woodland edge might be, and whether there's any evidence of browsing and things like that to help her prioritize and target her management. 
So these re results can be viewed alongside objectives for how we want to manage granular widths. And this can be linked to the long-term vision statement of how we want the reserve to look in 2070. So via our monitoring framework, we can then monitor change towards achieving this over time. We've also taken this approach at Carbrook Ravine, where we've been monitoring the condition of the meadows. And we found that there were five positive indicator species occurring across more than 40% of the site, which is great. And this has also included uh, southern marsh orchid, which we found on site when we got chatting to uh, a local who's kindly provided this photo for us. And this is a useful indicator species of habitat quality as it, prefer as it prefers non-disturbed habitats and wetter areas of meadows. And it's also locally rare in Sheffield. On the other side of that, we were also finding four negative indicator species across more than 40% of the site. So the most widespread of this was common ragwort, but we also found species like cre creeping thistle, curled dock and broadleaf dock. So currently, uh, part of the management does involve pulling common ragwort. And in fact, the quantities have decreased over the, over the years, which is a good sign. But we may want to target our management towards other unwanted species as well. Another site where we've taken the grid-based approach is at Blackamoor, uh, Calcic Bog, where we've been monitoring the condition of the bog. And we also monitored this in 2019. So last year we found, we were found, found that we were still finding high numbers of positive indicators across the site, uh, about 10 species, as you can see on this diagram on the left. Uh, as you can see on the right, we were also finding high levels of scrub and trees um, in some areas. And this map shows that there could be a relationship between air, higher areas of scrub and trees and lower positive species indicator numbers. So we'd like the level of scrub and trees to be lower in some places. And we so we can look at cutting back and carrying out targeted removal of these species to try and benefit the growth of positive indicator species. We've also been looking at the locally rare bog asphodel and at Calcic Bog we monitor flower spikes and also the area that the bog asphodel covers. So we found some interesting results. Whilst the monitoring framework began in 2019, the area was also monitored before the monitoring framework was implemented in 2014 and 2017. You can see from this graph that there was quite a large spike in the number of flower spikes recorded in 2019 compared to the other years. And looking at areas, you can see that the area was quite a bit lower in 2019 as well. So the good thing about this monitoring program is that we can build up a, a long-term data set and look at trends over time. So we need to ask ourselves, is this just a reflection of the fact that bog asphodel doesn't grow consistently year to year? and that there can be considerable year-on-year -year variation. Do we need to look more closely at things like the climate, the water table and grazing levels? Could it be related to numbers of volunteers uh, and the exact time of year that we did the survey and how detectable the flower spikes might have been in that, at that particular time? So these are all questions that we look to answer as we get more monitoring data over the years. We also undertake a transit-based approach because the spatial grid system of monitoring doesn't suit every taxonomic group. So for example, we've been carrying out bird species richness monitoring at Wyoming Brook and Fox Hag. So here we've used what we call the McKinnon list technique, which involves making short lists of bird species encountered and never repeating the same bird on each list. And the first lists inevitably have a lot of new species encounters but by the last list, the amount of new species encountered drops to one or zero. So we can end up creating species dis discovery curves. So this shows you the cumulative number of species over the number of lists that were collected. And I'm pleased to say that we managed to get over 30 species on both sites, which exceeded the target for these reserves. We can also look at 
species frequency, so the, the frequency with, with which each species occurred in each list that we collected. So knowing this enables us to see what species are more common and over time it allows us to track trends in species. And we also have target species for each reserve that we want to see during the breeding season. So for example, at Fox Hag, we found that bullfinch were present, but not the other target species of spotted flycatcher, wood warbler or willow tit. And this is most likely due to the fact that the woodland's quite young at Fox Hag, and these are kind of longer term aims for achieving having those species on site as the, as the woodland matures and as the management takes effect. At Wyman Brook, on the other hand, where the woodland is a bit more mature, we did find target species of wood warbler, pied flycatcher and spotted flycatcher, as well as dipper present on site. And here's a nice picture of pied flycatcher. So the population found at Wyoming Brook is known to be quite small, but significant due to declining national populations and because of the reserves position on the margins of the species range. A slightly different approach we took at Hammonds Field was a vantage point um, survey of breeding waders, as well as using the grid based approach to, to look at the rush pasture habitat. So this site is being managed for lapwing, curlew and snipe. And breeding waders require a complex habitat with varying sward heights, standing water and dense rushes. We know that snipe favour areas where rushes are left to grow densely and undisturbed, and curlew and lapwing prefer less densely vegetated habitats. So last year we had two confirmed lapwing nests within the site, which is good news. We also had curlew and snipe. Um, flying across the site and calling, as well as displaying in some areas. However, we couldn't confirm breeding of those species. But what this shows is that the, the, the habitat management is improving the habitat for these waders. And we can continue to monitor that over the time. So moving on to more data for nature and ecological monit monitoring that we rolled out across the local groups. So this project was initially aimed to involve 12 groups from both Sheffield and Rotherham, but due to COVID limitations, the numbers were narrowed down to six. And because of COVID, we didn't have any volunteer monitoring activity in 2020. So the project sort of restarted in April 2021. So we had a little bit less time for monitoring than we, than we would have normally had. So what we decided to do was focus on what could be monitored in that time period and what the interests and expertise were in the group. So this could be continued beyond the end of the project lifespan. So the groups are at different stages along their monitoring journey. And I'll just show you uh, a summary of this in the following slides. So Wadsley and Loxley commoners have been carrying out monitoring in three different areas the Bilbury Corridor with Bilbury and Heather, the hills with open sandy land and Heather, and also the wildfowl grassland area. And group members take an active role in, in the management of these habitats through mucking days. And what's been found from bee monitoring that's been taking place on the site is that two heathland specialist bees have been found, including the Heather mining bee and the Heathered, Heather girdled coleets. And this is a picture of that species. And both of these are uncommon in Sheffield and Rotherham. And both should benefit from the ongoing heathland restoration work. And the project also commissioned an expert to assess the status of fungi in the grassland areas. And it was found that these areas were rated as regionally important for its wax caps as eight were recorded in a single survey visit. And 13 species have been recorded in total and only a four further wax cap species would need to be found for the grasslands to be ranked as nationally important. And this is a photo of the golden wax cap, which was found at the site. Volunteers also undertook their own fungi surveys and they'll continue to carry out these surveys and add to the, to the knowledge of the expert report in future years. Watson Lock City Commoners have also carried out some family events such as the insect safari 
which is how to try and involve other members of the group and the wider community in the wildlife monitoring. So this involves sweep netting and collecting insects in pots and then releasing them after they've been identified. And one of the highlights was finding this hoverfly, which was recorded for the first time on the site. And of course, there are many enthusiastic children involved. So the next group is helping environmental regeneration in Broome Hall. And this group are monitoring butterflies and birds across the six sites that they manage for wildlife. The volunteers are mostly residents and students and they're working to create pollinator friendly green spaces which are linked by planters and provide habitat and natural food sources for birds. So through the weekly butterfly transex, they found three species of butterfly. And they've been carrying out weekly bird transects, finding 16 species, including red and amber list species, which are typical of the urban environment. The project also funded uh, an expert fungi survey in one of the grassland areas. And whilst we only found seven common species, this was two more than that had been named before the survey was undertaken. And this is uh, a picture of the lawyer's wig fungus, which is one of the species that was found. So the group has collected baseline data and it's hoped that in future monitoring will show an increase in species diversity over time as the plots mature and the older buckthorn whips become established and there's more connectivity to more areas you know, over time. The Warden Cemetery Group have been monitoring bird species found within the ancient woodland, heathland and riverside habitat covering cemetery grounds. And they found a total of 18 species, including five amberlist species. And this number is likely to increase as the monitoring continues and their skills improve. They haven't found the target species of kingfisher and dipper that they've been looking for as yet, although there have been ad hoc sightings of these species. So it's possible that they might be found in future years, uh, especially when we have a full season of survey data. And this group have really enjoyed meeting each month to take part in the survey as a group and helping each other with bird identification and learning about the birds occupying the habitats that they work to look after. The Friends of Porter Valley Group monitors bird species at nine distinct sites along the Porter Valley, with habitats including woodland, farmland and the Porter Brook. And this is the largest group taking part in the More Data for Nature project, with around 34 active survey volunteers. And more than 40 bird species were recorded. And it's hoped that monitoring birds will show any impact from the works taking place throughout the valley to improve the habitats and to encourage people who regularly walk the valley to submit biological records. They're also hoping to record the target species of the kingfisher and dipper during the breeding season, because these have only been recorded outside the breeding season so far. For Friends of Waterthorpe Park, the more data for nature project has set up a monitoring protocol and the group hopes to build engagement with the community to carry out monitoring of birds in the future. However, records are regularly submitted to Nature Counts by this group, amounting to over 100 records so far. And these include records of birds and plants, mammals, butterflies and a range of other invertebrates. And future monitoring recommendations have also been made for butterflies. The Althorpe Action Group are an independent community group who were formed to fight the housing development proposal on the Althorpe Fields green space in the Althorpe Estate in South East Sheffield. And they campaign to maintain the green open fields and woods of Althorpe Fields. And to help with this, they're very active in recording species and educating and encouraging the appreciation of wildlife by the local community. And the group regularly submit records to the Nature Counts page and so far they've recorded over 200 and, and over 2,400 records of 599 species, which is a huge amount. And it's hoped that this large collection of records will help to inform decisions made about the site in the future.
So all of the groups have been trained in how to submit records to Nature Counts. And this is our online sightings and recording system developed to enable individuals and groups to easily, easily share information about wildlife that they've seen. It's a fantastic data management tool. Records are automatically verified and validated through the iRecord system and transferred into our portal in the NBN Atlas, giving it a greater impact nationally. So anyone can create an account and submit casual records through the links on the homepage. And it allows us to store all of the data we're collecting through our monitoring work. And local groups have been able to use it without having to manage and maintain their own database. So in the past year, as part of the More Data for Nature project, we've developed the Survey Builder, where we can build custom survey forms that replicate the structure of paper forms that we use for our ecological monitoring. Like this, this is an example of woodland conditional monitoring survey builder form that we've created. So we can enter field data directly into Nature Counts, bypassing the need to enter it into spreadsheets. And it's not limited to species data. It enables us to record information like height of grass, habitat type, and species behavior or abundances as well. Another development has been these activities. So the local groups were given their own section on nature counts that the volunteers could be directed towards. And this provides all the links to the relevant survey forms that they might need. And records can also be separated out for analysis and summaries produced to visualize impact. So this, this nature counts tool provides a lasting legacy from the more data for nature project to improve and standardize survey methods and data collection, as was recommended in the Sheffield State of Nature report. And we've also provided training to partner trusts for continued use and maintenance of nature counts post post project. And these are the trusts we've been working with. So it just remains to say that this wouldn't have been possible without any of you. So thank you for attending training, going out and doing all the monitoring and helping to enter the data into nature counts. And I've just got a few uh, sort of facts here the number of hours that the volunteers have, have given to us over the past year, the number of records submitted, the number of volunteers engaged both in the local groups and in the nature reserves. So thank you to all of you and thank you to all of the Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife Trust employees who've, who've helped make this project a success. So I think it just remains for me to hand over to our guest spe speaker now, Martin Harvey. He's going to talk about why collecting data is so important and what happens to the data once it's submitted. So I'll hand over to you, Martin, if that's okay. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> Thanks, Anna. Um, really fantastic to, to see all the work that's going on there and uh, to see how that's building up. It's um, a really impressive program of monitoring and uh, yeah, obviously very well targeted to the, the um, conservation work that you're achieving. Um, and I think that sets the scene really well. Um, I, I've been asked to say a little bit about the where else records go and how they get used. And um, this is... Um, partly well largely enabled by the fact that the nature counts websites and all the recording forms are linked in as anna said to the iRecord system which enables them to be shared very quickly and easily with the national recording schemes and other places so i'll go straight to share my screen and um, we can have a look at um, some of those aspects <clears throat> okay so hopefully you're all seeing that seeing that screen um so yeah my name is martin harvey and i work at the biological records center which is a part of the uk center for ecology and hydrology um, which is always a lot of words to explain the fact of, of how these things fit together so um brc is is the the uh, abbreviation obviously for biological record center and that's um, really the the sort of main uh place that's behind um, my work in progress here um, and it's very good to be here and help 
celebrate data. It's always a good idea to celebrate data. We celebrate all sorts of things. We probably don't celebrate data very often, and perhaps we should do it more because it's very good stuff. Um, so the Biological Record Centre itself has been in existence for about, well, over 50 years now. And um, one of the things that we do is to work very closely with the national recording schemes and societies. And there are rather a lot of those. Um, at the moment, we have over 100 recording schemes and some monitoring schemes. And I'll say a little bit more about the difference in a moment and a few other um, groups as well that join in. And these are... The, the typical scheme is a national scheme, so it covers the whole country and it focuses on one particular species group. Uh, and that could be a really broad species group like the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland, or it could be something really specific. There are some recording schemes that just focus on one family of insects. So they are enormously varied in their scope and their size. And the largest ones, such as the British Trust for Ornithology and Butterfly Conservation, um, employ extensive staff themselves and do lots of direct research on their own data. Um, but the majority of the schemes, and certainly all the smaller ones, are entirely volunteer run. And it, it is, again, very much thanks to the efforts of, of these volunteers that the schemes exist and that, that can do so much to bring the records together. And one of the really rewarding things that I've seen in recent years is that new people do come forward to help run these schemes. We've had a number of new schemes set up and a number of older schemes have transferred into new hands, as it were. The latest new scheme to join the list um, is for oil beetles, um, which is quite a small family of beetles, but with some really fascinating um, species within that family and some fascinating life cycles. And Liam Olds recently set up a new recording scheme to focus on these and to try and encourage more people to, to look out for these and record them. One of the things that the Biological Record Centre has always done to work with the recording schemes is to help them produce the national atlases that get published from time to time. And over the years, the numbers of these have increased and the, the, the black dots on this chart are showing the, the slow accumulation of atlases right up until, well, from the first one in the 1960s up until 2015, and there have been more since then. And the red squares show the accumulation of computerized records, which in the early days, of course, was relatively slow, but in recent years has really caught up very quickly. And these days, of course, the vast majority of biological recording is mixed in with the whole computerization and how you share records online and uh, making data much more quickly accessible and transferable. But we do still publish paper atlases, and it is still quite a big part of our work with the recording schemes. An awful lot of work goes into producing an atlas and checking all the records and getting them all together from multiple different sources. And um, each one of these publications is a real landmark for that particular species group. It sort of draws a line in the sand as to the status of the species at that point in time and often stimulates a lot more recording to follow on as well to, to pick up on the information from the atlas. Um, a key distinction that um, I wanted to pick up on here is this difference between structured and unstructured recording. And the unstructured recording is basically what we all do if we go out and see a species, see, see some wildlife, and we just stick a record in to say that we've seen that species in that place and at that time. Uh, and we're not really following any particular method for that. It's just um, for fun quite often, or just because we've seen something interesting, we feel we ought to report it. Um, and those unstructured records sometimes go under these, what I always think of as slightly unflattering terms of being ad hoc or casual or opportunistic. Um, but they are really still very critical to the whole biological recording world. And I'll say a little bit more about why I think that is in a moment. And then the structured recording is much more the sorts of monitoring scheme activities that are following a, a more defined protocol and the sorts of things that Anna was showing us earlier on, um, where you're monitoring your particular sites according to a set protocol, um, are very much part of that structured monitoring process. And these two types of recording really go very well alongside each other. The structured recording does allow us to monitor change in a much more systematic way. Um, one of the problems with the unstructured records is that because they aren't following a particular protocol and anybody can record whenever they want, it does require a lot of interpretation to try and work out what the records actually mean. 
we may see 10 of one species one year and 200 the following year, but we may there may only have been 10 people looking for them the first year and 200 the second year. So there's all sorts of different variations and biases that can um, creep into the data. Um, but by combining the unstructured approach with the structured approach, we get the best of both worlds and the two approaches can, can inform each other. So some of the structured schemes, as I say, Anna's already given us some, a lot of good examples at, uh, that um, you're involved with. Some of the national structured schemes are around the monitoring schemes, and I'm sure you'll be familiar with many of these. The British Trust of Ornithology runs a wide range of bird monitoring schemes over the country. The butterfly monitoring scheme, which is the, the butterfly transects and some other surveys that they run. And there are monitoring programs for some of the other um, major groups as well. Um, and these are fantastic. They produce really good, um, reliable data that can be used for all sorts of analytical purposes. But they do require an awful lot of effort to set up and an awful lot of um, dedication on the part of the volunteers who take part in them. Most of these do involve regular repeated recording over time. Um, so they are quite intensive in that way. And it's probably the case that we're never going to have monitoring schemes that cover the whole range of species and sites around the country. But the ones that we do have do brilliant work. So the unstructured recording sort of fills in some of those gaps. Um, and this is showing some of the, the growth in publication of atlases again, and the fact that some species groups are now onto their second or third atlas. And that does allow change to be monitored over time, even from the unstructured records. And the most recently published atlas is for a set of three beetle families. And um, this was um, written by Steve Lane, Colin Lucas and Ashley Whiffin. Ashley is um, showing off the uh, publication of the, the atlas here. And um, this is a really fantastic example of atlases. Um, it does, of course, include the dot maps that you'd expect to see, but there's all sorts of other information in there. There's identification keys and a summary of the natural history and of the status of each species. And although this set of three families, um, a lot of which are carrion beetles, may not strike you as the most sort of popular wildlife subject in the world, um, the atlas has more or less sold out and is now going through into a reprint fairly shortly after it was published, and it has been uh, very well received. That aside, though, the important thing about this is that for these sort of atlas approaches it really is the case that every record counts every single dot on every one of those maps is only there because somebody took the trouble to go out and find a species and send the information in and without this fundamental knowledge of where species are and which ones seem to be rare which ones are common which ones are in the north which ones are in the south if we didn't have that knowledge then pretty much everything else we do for conservation would be much much harder we just wouldn't know what the priorities were we wouldn't know where the change was happening so um, i'm very much a believer that we do need to continue this unstructured monitoring alongside the equally important structured monitoring that can give us that detailed um, monitoring of change. The other thing that I've hinted at already that the unstructured recording does for us is to let us know which are the rare species and which are the common ones. And that feeds into all sorts of things like the old biodiversity action plan lists, which are now known as priority species under the NERC Act and red data species and nationally scarce and nationally rare and all these categories that you may have heard of all come down to analysis of these national recording scheme data sets uh, and the species records that everybody sends in. Um, and this particular example that we're looking at here is a rather splendid soldier fly known as the barred green kernel, which is one of the most endangered species in the soldier flies group. Uh, and in fact, is now only known from one site in Yorkshire. It used to occur in Wales as well, but sadly that population seems to have disappeared. But looking at the soldier flies and allies as just as one example of a species group that has been reviewed in this way, um, about half the group are rare to some extent at least and about um, just under a quarter um, are really under threat and in these endangered categories um, so again this really helps drive a focus on what we need to do to conserve these um, rare and declining species 
So what do the national recording schemes do? As I've said, they are enormously varied from really large ones to really small ones, and they all do slightly different things, but there's obviously a lot in common as well. Uh, and I suppose the thing they all have in common is that they are trying to collate records for that species group from many different people and places. They also play a very important role in checking the records and trying to ensure that the quality is as high as it can be. Um, and alongside that, of course, uh, in order to get good quality records, um, we need to help recorders, uh, which means providing feedback, providing identification materials, running training courses, and, and generally sort of acting as mentors to people who take an interest in the species groups. Um, and just infusing about the species group, um, carrion beetles might not be your first choice of a species to infuse about, but the the uh, people who run the scheme are hugely enthusiastic, enthusiastic about them and uh, have done a really successful job in getting other people interested and starting to get more recording going on. Um, I have the privilege of running the National Recording Scheme for Soldier Flies and Allies, which um, might explain why I chose a soldier fly example just now. Um, and this particular recording scheme focuses on 11 groups, 11 families of true flies. And they are a really fascinating group of insects. The 11 families are all quite different and have really intriguing natural history and life histories to them. Uh, and I, I won't allow myself to spend the rest of the evening telling you about soldier flies which I'm very tempted to do but I'll try to stop myself doing that but I did want to just use this as an example of some of the sorts of things that the uh, recording schemes do get involved with <clears throat> and here's just a couple of examples of the soldier flies um, a lot of them are quite tiny but they do have these really spectacular markings and colors um, to some of them the soldier flies group also includes the horse flies and the clegs, which tend to be a bit less popular again, but um, they do have their ecological role to play and they are much loved by the recording scheme, at least. Most recording schemes have websites these days, of course, and usually those websites are full of all sorts of useful information to help you identify and record species. Um, a lot of the schemes will produce newsletters on a more or less regular basis. And as I say, identification materials, if you go to the Soldier Flies website, there's a number of identification guides that you can download from there, um, which we hope will help you recognize what you're seeing, which will then lead to the records um, being more accurate and easier to verify when they come through. One of the things, the, the, the bee flies are one of the families within the soldier flies group. And one of the things that we do to try and get more people involved uh, is to run a project called Bee Fly Watch, which is active at this time of year. Hopefully many of you are familiar with the dark edged bee fly, the one on the left of the picture here, um, which is a, a quite a common species right the way across the country and is beginning to fly now. Um, and over the coming weeks, um, hopefully you'll see this one out and about. And um, for the last few years now, we've been running this Bee Fly Watch project, and there's no great scientific aim to this. It's really just about getting people out and enjoying watching these fascinating insects. Um, but it does contribute an awful lot of data and help us look at any changes in distribution and in flight patterns. Um, when we get a warm spring, the bee flies emerge noticeably earlier, and there's all sorts of interesting things that can come out of that. The species on the right, the dotted bee fly with a dotted pattern on its wings, um, used to be quite a rarity and was it was a species of concern for a while, but it has actually expanded quite a lot in recent years, still mostly confined to the south but I'll just point out that record there is from Haversage in 2020. It uh, wasn't seen again in 2021, but um, it would be really interesting to know whether it can be found again uh, around the Sheffield area or anywhere this far north. Um, we're not quite sure whether that represented a, a, a breeding population or just a, a stray one or even one that got stuck in somebody's car and driven up the motorway. Um, so these are the sorts of things that we can only really find out from this unstructured recording of people actually looking and finding new things in new places and letting us know about them. And bee fly watch is, I, I think, quite a good way of getting people interested in insects. Um, bee flies do seem to attract um, a particular attention to them. People enjoy seeing them. There's all sorts of comments we get about how cute and fluffy they are. Um, they are parasitoids of solitary bees, so they're not entirely 
harmless if you're a bee um, but so there's that whole sort of natural history interest there about how they interact with the bees and what's going on there that can also be used to help get people interested in them and learning a bit more about their ecology and they also play a role in pollination um, so they're quite a good tool for getting out some of those messages Okay, at this point, I just wanted to give you a chance to, to feed in some, some views. We're going to do a quick poll on getting involved with wildlife recording, um, which I think I will go straight into if I can remember how to get this working. Whoops, that wasn't the right thing to do. Uh, let's try this one. Here we go. Um, so this is the, there are two parts to this question, and it's going, the first part is asking you what inspires you to record wildlife, and the second part asks you are there any barriers that get in the way of you recording wildlife. So we'll set that poll going, and I'll give you a few moments to. I think you'll need to scroll down the uh, the, the page a little bit to see all the options, but if you can just tick the boxes as to what you think are the things that really help you record wildlife and the barriers that might get in the way. Okay, is that showing up for everybody? Yep, we're getting a few answers coming through. Okay, I think most people have got answers in. Just give you a few more moments. Okay, last chance to tick a box and then we'll see what the results are. Okay, let's go with that. Right, so hopefully you're now seeing on screen the um, set of answers to the first question. Um, so this is the what inspires you to get involved with recording wildlife. And the most popular answer there is enjoyment of being outdoors. And yeah, I'd certainly go along with that. That's, um, I, I think, if you don't enjoy being outdoors, there is wildlife recording that you can do without going outdoors, but um, I guess most of us are going to enjoy being out there and enjoy seeing the wild species. Um, seeing records used for conservation and for science score quite highly there as well, and um, that's obviously something that um, Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife Trust are doing a really good job of actually bringing those records through and making use of them. Um, Okay, and good to see that at least some of you enjoy entering your records, which not everybody does, but uh, yeah, that's, that is definitely part of the job, though. If you want to see your records used for conservation and for science, they have got to get into the system somehow. So I'm glad some people at least are enjoying doing that. Sometimes when I've run this poll on other occasions, um, the social aspect to recording scores really highly. Uh, and I think that can be something that is really motivating for some people, but equally some of us quite like to be out and about on our own and just focusing on the wildlife. And so, and there's, there's perfectly possible to, to have both of those approaches. So what barriers have we got getting in the way of recording wildlife? Well, it's fantastic that nobody has said that it's difficult to access places to see wildlife. So um, you're, um, I guess, a bit fortunate in that respect, because some people I know do find it difficult to get to places to see wildlife. So that's a, a good response there. Um, but the top barrier we've got here is lack of identification knowledge and lack of time, which is one that is always scores quite highly, I think. Um, and the lack of identification knowledge is, is I mean, I, I, um, again, not particularly surprised that's come up. It definitely is an issue that a lot of people raise. There's a lot of help available these days, certainly a lot more than there was when I started out getting interested in wildlife. But the, there does seem to be a real thirst for 
people increasing knowledge and um, even if you get to know a species group really well you might then want to move on to another one there's always more to learn and for me that's one of the fascinating things about recording wildlife that there's always more you can find out and more that you can start doing um and that's actually quite a good cue to um go on to uh, my next slide in the talk which is to point out that one of the things national recording schemes do um, to the best of their abilities is to provide lots of training and mentoring and that um, as we've seen is obviously something that is in demand this particular photo is from quite a long time ago now actually and standing up at the front there is roger morris and sitting in the corner next on the left hand side is stuart ball and roger and stuart are the two people who've run the hoverfly recording scheme for very many years and i don't know whether any of you have ever had the chance to go on one of their training courses but they've they've always been a real inspiration to me they've spent a huge amount of time traveling around the country running courses in all sorts of places and getting more people enthused um, for recording hoverflies and learning how to to identify them and just to pick out a couple of things and to actually put in a plug for the botanical society just to to try and get away from my entomological focus for a moment um, there are lots of workshops some of them online some of them in person that you can get involved with and obviously it depends on how accessible the the in-person ones are to, to where you are um, but a lot of stuff partly i suppose this can be seen as one of the few benefits to come out of the covid situation is that a lot of um online training has been put in place and there's all sorts of webinars and videos out up there that um, you can get to see um but just three examples here so the northwest invertebrates project is run by the tenictra trust they're based at liverpool museum and they've been running some fantastic events over recent years and there's there's some if you go to their website there's plenty coming up there the Botanical Society, as I say, have got a really well organised approach to training, um, both through their own efforts and through linking to other organisations, and there's lots of good information on there. And the Field Studies Council, of course, do lots and lots of events, many of them in conjunction with the National Recording Schemes, and there's just a quick plug there for um, a webinar that I'm doing with them, focusing on the soldier flies. Uh, I think that's in May, that one, but lots of other um, species focuses are there as well. Okay, so coming back to what actually happens to the records that people send in and coming back to some of the work that the Biological Records Centre does, um, as we've seen, there are all these wonderful recording schemes out there and wonderful people putting their records in and contributing to that. And that does produce a fantastic resource of information about um, species. And that has a lot of potential for being used for research and for feeding into um, conservation and policy as well. But as we've um, sort of mentioned once or twice, one of the problems with the general bulk of biological records is that they do have various biases to them. Um, we tend to go to places that we want to go to. We don't. We don't always go to our map and randomly choose exactly where we're going to go next we tend to go out on days when the weather's nice we tend to do all sorts of things that we're interested in um, which means that the data um, ends up with certain biases it's also the case that most recording schemes have seen an increase in records being submitted as time goes on um, and if you were just to look at the raw numbers on their own that might lead you to believe that wildlife's doing fantastically well because the records are increasing all the time but of course it doesn't necessarily mean that some species are doing very well but by no means all so there's a whole range of statistical approaches that um, some of my colleagues at BRC have developed in conjunction with many other academics to try and address these issues of the biases um, in space and time and how we can try and interpret those to extract um, genuine data about what's happening to the species. And one approach has been to look at these trends in occupancy. An occupancy is a way of taking all the records and trying to judge them systematically as to whether the things really have been increasing or decreasing. Um, and it's partly based on looking at records over time where they've been recorded in the same one kilometer square at, at least two time periods. And it partly uses some approaches around what other species have been recorded at the same time as the species you're looking at to try and work out whether the species, if it hasn't been recorded, is that because it wasn't there or just because nobody went to look for it. So it tries to iron out some of the, some of the biases in the, uh, the data here. 
And having produced these trends and trying to get a, a clear idea of what's actually happening to the species, that then allows uh, researchers to try and link those trends to other changes in the environment. And the, the little diagram on the left there is a quite well-known example of how um, mosses, bryophytes, um, some of those species are really sensitive to sulfur dioxide, which was a real problem when acid rain was more of an issue. Um, but over the last 50 years, a lot, some of those species, quite a lot of those species have recovered and managed to spread out again as that particular pollution problem um, has um, um, declined. The chart in the middle is showing some work from a few years ago looking at bees and how neonicotinoid pesticides affect them. And some of the work there has shown some really clear um, examples of the negative effects of those pesticides on wild bee populations. So taking the trends in the bees and looking at how that links to the way that pesticides have been used is, is another sort of practical approach to that. And a lot of these um, modelling typed trends are then sort of wrapped up into indicators um, which are used for various purposes but um, one of the things that has happened um, every year um, for some time now is that the government publishes a set of UK biodiversity indicators which actually cover a very wide range of environmental data but they include a number of indicators based on the species records that come through to the national recording schemes and Unfortunately, the biodiversity indicators often make for rather depressing reading. They do still seem to show that many of our species are declining despite the many conservation efforts that go on. Um, but these do provide a strong evidence base to allow us to argue for changes to government policy and to try and find ways of addressing this and turning that term decline round where we can. Um, I won't read out the quotes at the top of the page here, but these are from the Biodiversity Indicators document. Uh, and they do stress that these are produced as official statistics and that they do they are subject to this really vigorous data assurance, um, quality assurance um, procedures. And that all stems from the recording schemes in the first place, checking the records as carefully as they can and trying to put them, um, get them as accurate as possible to feed into all these different uses. Uh, the other one that you may be familiar with is the State of Nature report, uh, which the RSPB, in conjunction with very many other um, conservation organisations, um, last put out in 2019, and work is beginning to build up towards the next stage of Nature report at the moment. And again, quite a few of the figures here are based on the, the records that come through to the recording schemes. So how do they come through to recording schemes and where do the Nature Counts records fit into this? Um, well, one of the things that BRC has done in recent years to support recording schemes is to work in this area of online recording. And this really dates back to about 2012. At that time, it was clear that online recording was beginning to, to take off and it was going to be probably the way that lots of records were accumulated in the future. But there was also a real danger that we could end up with lots of different online recording systems and the data could all get fragmented into lots of different places. And we do have lots of different online recording systems, but over time we've got I think a bit cleverer about how we link them together and all the ones we're looking at here, although they all look quite different when you go to them, are all feeding their data in to this indicia system, that word was coined to describe the software behind all these systems, and that's the, the software that was developed and maintained within the Biological Records Centre. And all the things that we're looking at here, the records that are contributed to them are actually stored in the same data warehouse behind the scenes. Uh, and that allows for a more coordinated approach to these records. And in particular, what it allows for is for the records to be verified in one place. Uh, record verification is basically the recording schemes um, want to check that the records make sense. Uh, if a record's got a photo, then that's obviously one check you can do is to see whether it has seems to have been identified correctly. But it also takes into account things like whether the habitat seems right, whether it's at the right time of year, whether it's within the known distribution. And if the records fall outside those expected um, parameters, then that's when the verifier will probably want to go back to the recorder and ask some questions and find out if the, there is some evidence to support the record. And this is another 
really important bit of work that is done almost entirely by volunteers. Um, so the people who do verification of records in iRecord are, are nearly all doing it on the behalf of the voluntary recording schemes and are themselves um, very experienced volunteers for that particular taxonomic group. And when you log on as a verifier in iRecord, you get shown all the records for your taxonomic group from all those different sources. So including major counts, including all those other things we saw on the previous slide and, and many others that are out there feeding their records in. Um, so they, they all come into one place so the, the verifiers can access them without having to go to lots of different places and picking up the records in lots of different formats. Um, and that means that the records can be checked. We can provide a degree of quality assurance on them, which allows them to feed through to some of those other things we've been looking at. And also from that data warehouse, they can be shared with the national recording schemes, obviously. They also get shared with local environmental record centers. And for the most part, they, they can flow fairly quickly up to the NBN Atlas and be shared with the world, basically. So this is one of the benefits that we get from using these online systems. And for me, it's really encouraging to see how the Nature Counts project has managed to set itself up so well for your particular purposes, but at the same time, allowing that those records to contribute to all these other things um, through sharing them via these online systems. And over time, iRecord has increased in use. We are getting more people, more records coming through. And this does seem to be achieving at least some of the purposes that iRecord was set up for and the, and the whole Indicia system to allow a recorder in the field to get their record into the system and for it very quickly to flow through to all these other places that um, are useful for it to go to, to be used for conservation and research and other data uses. And Recently, we've started to make some connections with some of the other systems that are out there because iRecord is not the only online system. Um, and we are now trying to build connections with some of the others as well. So we are now establishing a data exchange with the bird track system, which focuses very strongly on birds, of course, but does also pick up some other species records. And the iNaturalist system that some of you may know um, is another online system that runs globally, it's based in America, but records for the UK that get put on that system are now also flowing into this Indicia setup where they can be accessed for verification by the national recording schemes. So we are, I think, getting a little bit better at joining some of these things up and bringing the data together so that it can inform this other work. And the final example that I want to show you this evening is uh, another use of the data. And um, this is thinking about the idea of gaps in biological recording. With the huge number of species and sites that are out there, we're never going to be able to record every species on every site all the time. It's just not possible to do. Um, so it does raise the question of how should we prioritise the recording that we do? And one answer to that is exactly what you're doing in Sheffield and Rotherham by having these really clearly defined projects to target um, on the, the sites that you're working with. Um, but at a, at a national level, there are other ways of thinking about this as well and looking at the records to try and work out how we should um, steer recording. And obviously, if you look at a species dot map like this, there are some white spaces on there where there are no dots at all. And this is actually the total records for the soldier flies recording scheme again. And outrageously, there are some spaces in the UK where nobody has ever recorded a soldier fly. And um, I have, of course, I hope to change that over time. Um, but it's the same with all the recording schemes, really. There are gaps where people haven't recorded, and that's one type of gap that you might want to go and fill. But it's not the only thing that might be important for conservation and research. And a new project that's been running for about a year now and is carrying on through this year is trying to investigate this a little bit further so this project is called decide it's um, um, led by some of my colleagues at the center for ecology and hydrology but again with very many partners from a number of organizations some of which i'm sure will be very familiar to you and this is currently focusing on butterflies and day flying moths and what it's doing is taking the data that we have and trying to model the distribution so that not just where things have actually been recorded but where they haven't been recorded it tries to work out what might be in the places where we don't have records 
But whenever you do that sort of modeling, what you end up with is some um, probabilities. Um, the modeling is not perfect and it can be more confident in places where we have got records and much less confident in places where we haven't. And if you go to the Decide website, you can zoom around the map and find the area you're interested in. So I've, I've centered this map on Sheffield um, just for this example. And we're looking at butterfly records here. And what the colors in this circle are telling you is how confident the models are that they know what's going on in terms of where butterflies are distributed. So the darker colors are where we are quite confident that the model is telling us something useful and the more yellow brighter colors are the places where we don't have much confidence in the data and that therefore would really benefit from having some extra records coming in. And quite a number of those yellow areas are um, around the more urban areas of Sheffield, I think, and that probably explains why not so many records get sent in from there but it would still be useful to have some recording in those areas to, to build up the um, probability for this particular approach. And if we look at the same thing for day flying moths, we see a similar pattern, but with much more yellow on it. And this is because fewer people record day flying moths. So the models have much less um, confidence in their predictions. The other thing you can do on the Decide website is to ask it to give you some suggestions as to places that would be really useful for you to go and record at. And if you click on any one of those suggestions, it will give you a little bit of information about what the model thinks are the habitats in that area and what it thinks you might find. So this one says the model predicts that there could be eight species of day flying moth in that particular area and that this is a high priority site for, for extra recording. So this is just a, a this is an experimental approach to doing this. And one of the things that this project is really keen on is to get feedback from recorders as to whether you do find it useful, whether it is something that would inspire you to do a bit of extra recording, and whether you do feel that it's a, a good use of your time. So if any of you, particularly those of you with an interest of seeing butterflies and day flying moths, fancy having a go at this and providing some feedback to the project, um, that would be very, very welcome indeed. But of course, you have plenty of really important priorities to be getting on with <laughs> for the uh, More Data for Nature project. And I think one of the things that can be a bit confusing about wildlife recording, because there are so many projects going on, what do you choose to get involved with? And in the end, that's got to be your choice and it's got to be based on what you enjoy doing, and at least part of the, the, the answer. But also what are the priorities for the things that you're really interested in? But I think it is worth spending a bit of time thinking about what's going to um, be the best use of your time and how the data is going to be used. And certainly the projects that are coming through the more data for nature approach, I think are really, really worthwhile from that point of view. But the fact that the records are then also shared with this wider system and feed through to all the other things we've looked at, I, I think is really, really good news. So just to finish, um, personally, I go out and record wildlife because I love doing it and I would probably do it even if none of these websites existed and no research was being done and the data wasn't going anywhere, I'd probably still do it because I just love doing it and it's great to get out in the field and learn from other people and see the wildlife. But it really is an extra reward on top of that to know that if I do send my records in that they can get out to all these other places and be used for all these other things. And I think this is actually a really fantastic partnership across the board from the volunteers out in the field through to the databases through to the researchers back into the policy and the conservation it really does make an awful lot of very important and and good links and it's um, something that loads of people can get involved with at lots of different levels in that process and by working together i think we can really achieve something that's much more than the sum of its parts um, so that's really, I guess, my main sort of message from this evening. So just to say thank you. Um, I, 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 one, I'm, I'm going to mention just one of my colleagues at BRC, and that is um, John Van Breeder, who's not actually employed at BRC. He's, he's independent, but he does an awful lot of the technical work developing these online systems. And I know he's done a lot of work on the Nature Count system. And John is an absolute genius at coming up with solutions to these biological recording um problems um 
BRC is funded and supported by a number of public bodies that help keep all these things going. But of course, a very big thank you to everybody who does contribute the records and get involved with the recording schemes and do the verification. There's a huge amount of voluntary effort that goes on there, um, without which none of this would happen. And that brings me to the end of the talk. Amazing. Thank you very much, Martin. That was fascinating. Um, so, yeah, now time for, for questions. So if you have questions for um, either Martin or Anna um, about any um, anything that they've talked about today, please um, either bung it in the chat or if you're brave, you could put up your virtual hand um, and ask a question. Um, Anna, we did have a question uh, early on about uh, some of the kind of negative indicator species that you mentioned um, to do with them, the kind of grassland monitoring. So things like ragwort. Um, so maybe you could go into a little bit of detail about the, the ecology or the ecological reasons why we'd be removing ragwort and thistles and, and, and why we wouldn't want them to become too dominant. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're just sort of <laughs> species that can take over certain areas and prevent the more positive species, indicated species from, from growing. Um, I think we also remove common ragwort because if we want to use, um, if we want to do, carry out a hay cut, um, you know, we need to remove those because um, they can't really be eaten <laughs> in the hay, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, that's that's sort of the main reasons for removal. Have you got any more to add on that, Pete? Yeah, I think it's just it comes down to, like you said, the practical um, element in terms of uh, if we um, kind of sell the hay or, um, you know, if we have, um, for example, at Carhouse Meadows, we have a grazier there. Um, so, you know, in terms of livestock, we need to make sure that um, we're removing things like ragwort. But then also, yeah, species becoming too dominant um, and uh, they're quite vigorous uh, growers, aren't they? So they can often outcompete um, some of the uh, you know, rarer, more interesting species um, that we're trying to hope to, to get on those sites. So uh, do we have any, any questions at all from, from Martin? I, I do, so I can kick, um, kick, kick it off a little bit. So I, I, I was wondering about how you maybe see recording kind of evolving. Um, so particularly thinking there about technology, so stuff like eDNA and um, audio monitoring and, and things like that. And, and then also on the verification side of things, like AI kind of an automated verification. Yes, that, yeah, there's quite a lot of <laughs> a lot of things in that question, um, Pete. But yeah, I mean, there definitely are some really interesting and potentially exciting things on on the right. Well, some of them are, are already beginning to happen in quite a big way. So um, the use of DNA approaches to um, pick up on species occurrences is definitely um, something that's happening more and more. Um, I guess it's been sort of pioneered in the freshwater environment, but it's it's spreading much more widely than, than that at the moment. Um, and it does raise a lot of questions um, as because um, the, ident the, the identifications that you get from some of the DNA work are still sort of in their early days and um, are not always very precise. Um, and in fact, we've got a meeting coming up at the Biological Record Centre with a lot of national recording schemes in a few weeks' time to talk through some of these issues and to try and work out whether the DNA records should be part of the recording schemes or whether it's a slightly different set of data. But either way, it is going to start producing a lot of data, um, I think, in the fairly near future and will undoubtedly add to our knowledge. But it's also going to raise some questions about whether we are really identifying the species that the DNA seems to tell us are species or whether there's lots of hidden species or whether species need to be lumped together that we think are separate. So I'm sure there's going to be lots of um, to and fro there. And similarly with the automated um, sound recognition and so on is going to start produ potentially producing enormous amounts of data, which will not be possible for every single one of those records to be checked by a human verifier. There's just going to be too many of them. 
So probably the artificial intelligence type approaches and image recognition and so on will start to play a role. All these things are still somewhat in their infancy and the, some of the audio detection is getting pretty good. Some of the visual automated recognition is very impressive, but also quite mixed again across different species groups. So it's definitely got a role to play. It's getting better all the time and the advances are, are really quite phenomenally quick in, in some areas. Um, so yeah, I think it's exciting, but also a little bit daunting as to what this might mean for sort of traditional biological recording. But what I hope it's going to mean is we get more information, another layer of information to go alongside the other things that we do. What it's not going to do is make real people recording wildlife redundant because we we still need people out there looking and studying and working out the life histories and there's still lots of basic natural history that we don't know about a lot of our species and I, I don't see dna or any of these other approaches really solving that they might give us extra information but we still need a lot of human thought and investigation to go along with it yeah thank you thank you it's really interesting it's got the capacity to kind of overwhelm us hasn't it um yeah but you know, equally very exciting. Uh, okay, so another question for you, Martin. So how important is it to record common species? Um, for example, magpies, gray squirrels, things like that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I do think it's very important, um, but it does, again, come back to this issue of prioritizing how you spend your time. And you could go out your front door and record a blackbird or whatever it is every time you go out your front door and is that really the, the best way to spend your time um so i think it it does depend partly on the different species groups um for some species groups the overall level of recording is still sort of quite low and every record of every species is important there is also the issue that as we well know some species that used to be thought of as common have now become quite rare but we don't necessarily have very good data on that because nobody thought they were worth recording when they were common so th there's lots of good reasons for doing it but I, I suppose for some of the groups like birds and so on where the records of common species become more useful is when they become part of one of the structured approaches and whether that's the approaches that you're taking through your mckinnon list and so on or through one of the bto surveys that's where the additional data that you get from the structured monitoring is really really useful for those common species uh, but once you go beyond the major groups um, into some of the other insect groups for instance then yeah, all species records, I would say, are important. And yes, we do want the common species as well. Yeah, I always give the example of um, house sparrow. That, you know, was really, really common. And I imagine back then, if we'd have had I record, people wouldn't have uh, recorded it. <laughs> and now, you know, it's one you know very endangered species. Uh, OK, uh, another question for you, Martin, from Peter Long. Um, so you, di you did kind of mention a few examples in uh, throughout your talk around where um data has, has informed conservation decisions um i wonder if the, you've got maybe one or two um kind of that spring to mind that are, you know data that's kind of led to a um you know uh, some sort of concrete conservation decision yes that's a really good question um it's the sort of thing that makes my mind go go blank i'm sure there's lots of really good examples out there um i mean at a, at a general level it certainly is the case that some having data about declines in wildlife does influence government policy it may not influence it anywhere near as strongly as some of us would like and um as we've seen, the, the fact that there's a lot of the indicators are still going down certainly means that it hasn't got to the point that it really should do. But it nonetheless remains the case that if we didn't have the data, it would be very much harder to even talk to government about these things and um, trying to influence those sort of policy level decisions. Um, the first question always is what is the data what's what is the importance is can we really prove that there's a problem and we can we really do something about it so um it is fundamental at that general level to that sort of thing uh and more specifically i mean i 
there, there are obviously examples where species data has really influenced local planning decisions about whether something can or can't go ahead. And again, I'm sure we can all think of examples where we have disagreed with the decisions that have been made, uh, but there could have been many more bad decisions if data wasn't available to, su to support the cases that are made for them. And I can certainly think um, in my own part of the world, I, I live in Buckinghamshire and uh, the, the, the local wildlife trust here, there are many of their nature reserves where I have seen them make use of the data to inform their management and, and produce some really good results. One of the, site, the, one of the sites that first got me interested in this whole area really um, was um, I've, I started volunteering on, a, on my local reserve, which is a site that has the military orchid, which is one of the rarer orchid species. And the volunteer reserve warden there was absolutely brilliant at monitoring the military orchid, but also really, really interested in all the other types of wildlife. Uh, and, and between a group of us, we, we did gather lots of information about all, as many different species groups as we could. And it was fascinating seeing how that could then feed into the management plans and adjust the things we were actually doing on the site. So I think across the board, there definitely are examples right from that local level through to the national policy that um, where wildlife data really does make a difference. Um, but we still need to keep pushing away at it and trying to get even better outcomes um, for conservation. Yeah, I mean, uh, from a kind of a local example that I can think of. Um, is, so obviously we have there's a big tree planting agenda, isn't there, particularly uh, here around the kind of northern forest. Um, and making sure we're getting the right tree in the right place is really important. Um, and one of the uh, kind of criteria for that are wading birds. And the, in, we know the impacts that uh, tree planting can have on populations of, of waders. So, you know, and so, so before doing any sort of kind of tree planting, you know, the, whoever's doing that, whether that's us at Wildlife Trust or Forestry Commission Woodland Trust will interrogate the data um and they will be looking for records for wading birds so you know that they are relatively common i guess around here people might not think to to record them but that is a concrete kind of conservation decision um whether or not that's a suitable place to to kind of plant trees or not yeah and there have been some examples in various parts of the country that i've, I've seen recently of um where I think it's been particularly for botanically rich sites where there might be a real flower rich grassland and it's ended up having trees planted on it and and the claim from the organisations planting the trees is that they just weren't aware that there was anything important there and to some extent you can be sceptical about whether they really tried very hard to find out but it's also the case that if if data isn't shared and isn't made available through all the places we've been talking about then it does become really hard to for other people to pick up on that and to try and make use of it to to um, to make the right decisions so i, I think that sharing of data the, the recording is obviously very important but getting it out there so that it can be available to people to to um, so they can't hide behind saying that they've got no information um i think that's also really important yeah definitely um and then uh, another question from rich um so he says uh, somebody like me who's Kind of not associated with a particular monitoring scheme or group is it best to submit records to i record or to search out the relevant recording scheme or does it not matter in the end as everything goes into the indicia warehouse and mbn atlas um yeah i guess it's not quite as simple as that so an awful lot of the recording schemes do pick up their records from i record but they will also quite happily accept records that are sent to them directly um so it's it, we're not in the situation and we probably never will be in the situation where there's only one place and that's where everybody goes and everybody does it all exactly the same way. We do have to allow for different people to do different things as benefits in diverse diversity in recording systems, just as in many other areas of life. Um, so there are choices, but um, certainly if, if, if you are collecting records across a number of different groups, putting them on iRecord is a really good way of getting the records all out there and with at least the potential to be shared. If you've got a real interest in one particular species group, then the, the recommendation is always to contact the recording scheme for that group and ask them what they want you to do with the records. And they may well say they're very happy to have them through iRecord, or some of them will say they prefer to have them direct. Um, 
so in the end, the decision is yours as to what works best for you. But um, yeah, I think if recording, if you're recording generally, then I think I record probably is the best solution at the moment. Um, but for that species focus, do talk to the recording scheme, um, either nationally or if there's a local representative and find out how they work. Mm. Yeah, and I think collaboration is key really with, uh, with all the recording schemes and platforms and, and so on. Uh, okay, uh, Anna, I've got a question for you. Um, so in relation to the methodology that we use, so have we identified any lessons to be learned from the project, any improvements or tweaks? Um, and then uh, Philip also asks, uh, has anything unexpected come out of the survey work at Greno, which is, that's his local reserve? Um, I think, yeah, I think, <laughs> Every year when we do the monitoring, we always try to come away with lessons learned, but um, ideally we wouldn't change the protocol too much because um, we want it to be sort of consistent um, year on year. But if we're finding there's a sort of a good reason to change it, we might, might do that. Um, I think it's probably slightly early days to do that yet. But sort of as we as as time goes on, I think um, yeah, there may be some things that may need to be maybe may need to be tweaked along the way. Um, in terms of Granite Woods, it was more of a baseline survey, so um, it was things like, for example, um, we we weren't meeting woodland edge habitat targets, but that's because um, there are quite a lot of mature trees around the edge of the woodland. So one of the things I was discussing with the nature recovery manager was potentially doing some kind of internal ecotones rather than looking at around the edge of the woodland. Um, and, you know, Greno Woods is partly sort of commercially forested, but part of the plan at the moment is to um, sort of move away from that and move to more, to more kind of broadleaf um, conversion in areas. So from the information that we have now, when we've established where sort of the coniferous woodlands and the broadleaf woodlands are, we can look at how tree planting um, and, and sort of conversion to broadleaf takes place um, as we carry on and do some more monitoring. Um, yeah, I think, that, I think that was probably about it really. <laughs> yeah. I think the consistency is the key with the with the protocols, isn't it? Because if we were to make a change every time, then that change incrementally over a long period is a big change in the way we're looking at um, our monitoring. And that then makes it much harder to look at trends over time, doesn't it? Uh, OK, so there's uh, another question from Rob, um, which it might be best if I answer, actually. It's uh, so is it possible to interrogate nature counts? Um, or do we have to wait for the data to be managed? Uh, so I guess it depends what you mean by managed. Um, I guess, so if you um, have, have an account that makes accounts, you can see your data as it goes in. Um, if you're part of one of the local groups and you're, you've got um, the activity there for your local group or one of our trust projects, then you can uh, see all of that data and interrogate that. Um, but then it also there's a kind of monthly flow of data that from the BRC warehouse onto the MBN Atlas, um, and there you can download the records. Um, you know you could analyze that to your heart's content, really. Um, but yeah, so you maybe we'd encourage you to go onto the MBN Atlas. I think you know that that is a really good resource anyway because actually it amalgamates all of the data from all of these different places. So you know if you're interested in a particular species. You wouldn't want to just look at the data that's on nature counts you'd also want to look at all of the other data that's been recorded in the area of interest um, so going somewhere like the the atlas is, is probably best so i think that might be it for questions can't see any that i've missed so last chance i guess if anyone has any uh last questions to put them in the chat or to put up a hand Okay, well, 
thank you very much everyone um, for coming. It's been a really interesting evening. Thank you, Martin, for a fantastic uh, talk. Um, you know, it's really, really great to see where the kind of the the context, the national context of all of the the work that we do locally here. Um, you know, it's really interesting to see where the, the data goes, and um, hopefully, people feel that they're a, a part of a bigger picture. Um, so, thank you very much for for coming along tonight and and, and talking. Uh, to us. Um, also, Anna, thank you very much for um, your talk and uh, updating us on the, the Data for Nature project. Um, I'm sure uh, as the survey season comes around next year, you'll be looking for more volunteers so um, people can watch this space and, and uh, if they're interested, can contact us and get involved. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, we'll leave it there. Uh, and yeah, Thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry. Just thank thank you very much for for coming. Yeah, that's been, um, uh, yeah. Thanks for inviting me. It's been uh, it's been fascinating to find out more about the work that you're doing. And uh, yeah, that's great. Go out and look for bee flies. Send your yeah. records in. <laughs> go 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 and do some some recording and and find more uh, interesting species around Sheffield and Robin. <laughs>